found a what we assume is a fission reactor 29 miles in diameter. You can see the dome yeah. there. You can see the support sections there. Have we missed anything, John? Is there something uh, that you wanted to cover <coughs> that, that we haven't had a chance to look at? Just let me talk a little bit about the civilization on the moon, because that's okay. been the thrust of my... And, and tell us something like about it. the glass structures that ha that the Hoagland's talking about, because he, he calls it glass. He said it's a special kind of glass, but do you agree with him? No. Okay, and why not? Because he's talking about, I think, the Apollo 14 pictures, and his thrust is those glass structures are domes. Right. And those domes are what contain the air. No, the, the air, it's a, it's a thin atmosphere, but as you know, according to Boyle's law, <clears throat> the, uh, the, in an atmosphere, the, the lower it is, the thicker it is. So if you have, and I've had some wonderful drawings I posted, but I don't see them in here. As a matter of fact, I'm going to try and find them so that you can um, uh, take a picture of them because they draw exactly what I'm talking about. Um, the air settles into the craters, and if you're in the crater, you can breathe fine. If you get out of the crater, it takes a little uh, longer. But basically, the civilization of the moon <clears throat> starts back at Newton. Somebody has influenced our thought about the moon since the beginning of our, our thinking about anything. Uh, Newton, for instance, he started to uh, venture to say that, you know, there might be... Um, more mass on the moon, uh, and that's brought out in his three books uh, now called Principia. <clears throat> Shortly after Newton died, somebody modified his thoughts to make what is called the um, um, New Newton Law of Universal Gravitation, which is Fg equals G times M1, M2 over R2, and uh, he didn't come up with that. That was somebody else. He didn't think that you had to specify what the mass was. But anyway, in 1856, there was a Danish, Danish mathematician and astronomer named uh, Peter Andreas Hansen. And uh, he proposed, he had been uh, uh, um, researching the uh, times and, uh, and the periods of Saturn and several other things. He was very knowledgeable. But anyway, he was also looking at the moon, and he had found something strange about the moon that when you uh, uh, did the predictions on where the moon should be for a particular time, for its particular mass, it was not there. And uh, so in 1956, he went uh, uh, before the Royal Society, Astronomical Society, and proposed that the, um, there was a bump on the back far side of the moon that was actually uh, um, uh, the center of gravity was actually placed 57 kilometers farther out in space uh, than had been generally realized and for that reason he thought that there might be atmosphere on the far side and with this atmosphere he thought there might be plants vegetables and maybe even human life so he was regarded as uh, as a hero and a very interesting guy up until 1870 when a guy named Simon Newcomb came to Paris and told everybody that Peter Andreas Hansen was full of beans, there was not a shred of truth to it, and that even if he was right about these different times, that uh, it wouldn't make any difference. So guess who Simon Newcomb was? He was a rear admiral in the U.S. Navy and head of the U.S. Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C. The reason people have trouble with an atmosphere on the moon is to have an atmosphere, you have to have gravity. And people think that it's one-sixth gravity, and they've been sold that over the years. Um, somebody has had an agenda here so that we don't think that there's any gravity on the moon. But there is, and the way it can be proven is by using the bully aldous newton Law of Inverse Square, which takes the size of the planets, the diameter of the planets, and the neutral point. Uh, the neutral point is that point between the Earth and the Moon where the gravity of the Earth exactly meets the gravity of the Moon. Now, NASA has traditionally told us that that's 24,000 miles. And if you work out the uh, inverse square law with 24,000 miles, <clears throat> the Moon 
does have one sixth gravity, but the fact is the neutral point is at 43,495 miles. How do we know that? We know that because Werner von Braun told us that in 1968. We know that because in two of the books of Apollo, including Apollo 17, and there was another Apollo mission, they specifically told, you know, specifically said, here we are at 39,000 miles and the, uh, uh, and at the neutral point. So we know that it's, that it's uh, between 39 and 43,000 miles, and either one of those would work out to be about <clears throat> 60 to 64% gravity Earth. So, having 64% of gravity Earth, it can hold an atmosphere. And how the people say, well, if it has an atmosphere, uh, you know, how does it keep the atmosphere? Well, the same way the Earth does. Uh, they have uh, uh, forests, uh, meadows, lakes, rivers, people, civilizations, and um, it's on a band uh, of the moon that's just beyond where we can see. And I have a picture here, but, but I can't find it. But it's on a band, and that's the same band that both uh, Menger and Adamski visited. I'm pretty sure Menger uh, actually went to the moon in 1954. Uh, <clears throat> they let him step out of the train uh, and breathe the air. Uh, he's, 90, he's 86 years old, uh, living in uh, Vero Beach, Florida. I emailed him the other day to get the exact color of the moon. And if you could reach that picture, I could hold it up. It's behind the cigar box uh, of the moon, the color picture of the... Um, I'm sorry, Don, I don't understand. Oh, the color picture of the moon? Yeah. <clears throat> you mean Dawn in the library? Uh, sorry, which one are you referring to? It's the long picture with the yellow sky. Up at the top? You, mean, you don't mean on the wall, do you? No. No, no, behind the cigar box. Oh, here. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Oh, I see those cigar boxes. I was looking at those. No, just hand me that photo right there. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, I've seen this before. Tell me what this is. Okay, this is the crater Copernicus, and this is the same photo that's up there, but all I did was put the exact color of the lunar sky. And how do I know that? Because I emailed uh, Howard Menger in Florida who took a trip there in uh, 1954, and uh, when he, when he uh, looked up into the sky, he said that's the exact color he saw. He describes it as a saffron color, and I sent a number of swatches with different color saffrons to him in Florida, and he marked the X on that particular color. And so I put that color behind the crater Copernicus, and that's the color of the sky. Why would it be that color? Why wouldn't it be... We think it's that color because uh, although the uh, atmosphere is not as dense as the Earth, it's higher, and the uh, the rays reflecting through uh, the atmosphere will go more towards yellow. But what you get on a um, on high mountains on Earth, for example, is you just get a darker blue. Um, I, I mean, I know that because I've been there. Um, is it, it would be a different composition of atmosphere in order to create that color effect, surely. It would, it, it would contain different, different gases. Do you know anything about that? No. Okay. okay All I know person... is it's breathable. He, walked, he stepped out. He said it was very hot, but not as hot as we're led to believe. And he said uh, you certainly couldn't stand it for very long. But then he looked up and saw that color sky. Now, What's, Can you tell us something about him? What is his background? Howard was just uh, uh, a person living a normal life, and they came and, uh, or they, the moon people came and invited him to go up there. He wrote this book called Secrets of the Flying Saucers from Outer Space, One Man's Fantastic Revelations uh, of Visitors from Other Worlds. He has a website. Uh, um, I've read this book several times, as you can see. <clears throat> Here I've highlighted exactly the, uh, says what, what he did on the moon, what he, uh, where he was taken. Uh, there was a lot of other people. He said the place he went, uh, one of the places was like the Valley of Fire in Nevada. Uh, he says, there we stopped long enough for our guide to open the door and permit us to stick our heads out for a brief moment, which was all one could take, for it was terribly hot outside like a blast furnace. I was certain that no one could have lived outside very long and was glad to have shut the door. So is that uh, maybe a basis for the domes as well? Because, you, you know, you can 
regulate right. regulate temperature. You can re regulate. Yeah, I'm sure there's there's small domes. I don't think there's any like Hoagland is saying though. Huge domes all over the place. So, uh, here he says, uh, 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 I looked up in the sky. It was a yellowish color. When looking, I had a queer, queer uh, impression that if I walked some distance, I would fall off since the uh, horizon was fo so foreshortened. Uh, he, he, there was other groups with him, along with ordinary folks, scientists, geologists, electronic engineers, rocket experts, astronomers. And so this guy is, you say, in his 80s at this point? 86. He was 86 the other day. Have you met him in person? Not in person, okay. only on email. But, um, and but basically, there, as far as you're concerned, he has no reason to lie, right? No, no, because his story is the same as George Adamski's, uh, uh -huh. Truman Bethay Room, the other, what the government labeled as contactees, which was their way of saying, yeah, well, you know, they're just contactees. And uh, I think both of them, both of Damsky and Menger became uh, uh, very important sources for were... the government. When I first got into this, you know, 20 years ago, and people would say, you know, what do you, well, you know, think flying saucers are real? And I'd say, yeah, but you know, that George Obscansky stuff was all bullshit. It wasn't. It was all real. So it was Howard Mendry. So it was Truman Bethayrum and uh, yeah, Daniel yeah. Fry. All those people were telling, you know, the exact truth. But the fact is, <clears throat> um, if you've been to Living Moon, you've seen the original government papers on who was involved in the anti-gravity project in 1952. And Lear Incorporated, my father's company, is listed right there. And uh, there's a video floating around uh, on the um, on the web that shows him at the blackboard, teaching scientists at the Bonson Institute uh, how a flying saucer flies. And this was probably 1954 or 1955. Uh, but the fact is, we had anti-gravity solved in 1957 or 1958, and we started building our own craft and went to the moon in, in 1962. And Mercury, Gemini, Apollo was just a cover for all that w was really going on. And now what do you say about the all the NASA pictures, all the Apollo photos of the moon which do not show a saffron sky? What's going on there? Yeah, it always shows pure black and the reason is they couldn't show the real color. That's why all those photos are so fake. That's why there's no stars there. They didn't have much of a choice, you know. They're trying to say uh, that it's dark, that it's a uh, a vacuum. Well, first of all, it can't be a vacuum because Neil Armstrong says he could pick up the uh, the, the dust with his toe, and we all know that a vacuum uh, that the uh, uh, the uh, dust will settle into a crust, and you can't pick it up with your toe. <clears throat> and uh, they couldn't show the sky because it was a saffron color, and that would lead everybody to believe there was atmosphere. So I'm not sure whether Apollo 11 went, and here's why. Now, it may have gone to the moon, the command service module, and may have orbited the moon, but the problem I have is they only had 22,000 pounds of fuel, and uh, they went into uh, an orbit that was about 50 miles by about 10 miles. Uh, this would be impossible with 64% gravity, but even if it was, <clears throat> from 10 miles they'd have to go down to the lunar surface uh, surface land and then take off with 22,000 pounds of fuel. Uh, I don't think that happened. I don't think they could do it. That's not enough fuel to do that. Uh, second of all, I have a group of uh, friends that uh, remote viewed Apollo 11, did it land, and they and they weren't able to see any kind of landing. Uh, all they were able to see was it was a CIA cover up of somehow. Uh, the other one is uh, Aldrin's comment, <clears throat> and I just like to. Um, Read from Buzz Aldrin's book. Uh, not, the pardon? To say, the what? Yeah. Here's what Aldrin says when uh, he's asked, how did it really feel to be on the moon? And he bristles, quote, for Christ's sake, I don't know. I just don't know. I have been frustrated since the day I left the moon by that question. Yeah, that's amazing. <clears throat> um... The fourth reason is the video of the light standard uh, crashing. Now, the one small step for a, a man. Now, that's been alleged to have been a joke, but if it was, 
uh, it was extremely well done and very expensive. My opinion, my opinion is that it was real, that that was during the filming, uh, and I based that on uh, little details like the ladder, like the shadows, uh, everything about that tape is real. I think that was a real outtake of one small step for a man. Uh, number five, <clears throat> the G's to required to orbit and deorbit. Uh, as you know, the lunar lander had no couches, had no seats, had no chairs. They stood up. They stood up and they had an armrest under here and one under here, and all they had is a little belt that came out from the side and wrapped around them. Now that's not even good for a seat belt. They're called uh, pilot restraints. That's all they had. And you're telling me they came out of orbit at, at 50,000 feet and landed and then blasted off with, with an armrest? No, no, I, I don't think that happened. And the other is uh, the different ladder in the any picture of, of one small step for a man and photos of the uh, Apollo 11 taken after that show uh, a much thinner ladder, one made of tubular, uh, looks like aluminum, compared to the one uh, in one small step that is at least that thick, and uh, it's, a, it's an L-shaped. So that's my take. Uh, Apollo 11, uh, I don't think landed. The others, maybe, but I'm not sure. If they did, if any of them landed, it was with technology that used anti-grav. That's, that's what we were told. We were told that they, they had help. Otherwise, they would not have been able to land. That was the only way they could have done it. And they wouldn't have been able to get through the Van Allen belts. Do you have any view about that? I believe that to be true. The only reason I hesitate is because Bob Lazar told me that uh, there was nothing dangerous about the Van Allen belt. But what you say about the Van Allen belt, uh, sleeper is is adamant about. He said nobody can get through that. He said that's a protective layer around the earth so that we can't get out. The only way that we right. could get that's out was with help. We were told that too from the inside. And exactly that's what the same Sleeper thing. is very adamant about that. Very interesting. Okay. Now, um, I have to ask you about the standard rebuttal to the atmosphere issue which was that when you're looking at the moon through a telescope and you see a star, it doesn't twinkle, it's just crystal clear, just like it's always there, and then it suddenly disappears. People who say that haven't done that. First of all, if you read V.A. VA Fursoff's book called uh, A Strange World of the Moon, you'll see that there's many instances of occultation. But the fact is occultation can only occur uh, is if there is uh, some sort of uh, uh, dust or, uh, or kind of sediment in the atmosphere. Here on Earth, there's all kinds of problems up there. On the moon, it's clear, perfectly beautiful. Um, you know, depending on the thickness, uh, you may not see uh, occultation, but if you want to read uh, Strange World of the Moon by V.A. Fursoff, he lists at least uh, 14 or 15 astronomers that have seen occultation. Okay. I want to check my understanding of the issue of the the um, the center of gravity of the moon being offset from the center of the moon. Have I understood that right? Correct. Uh, it's 57 kilometers further away from Earth than is normally thought. And of course, that's confirmed by Apollo. Too. That doesn't sound like it's enough to make any difference to anything. That's a very small amount relative to the size of, of the moon, which is... Well, uh, of course, we don't know what the moon's made of. We don't know how much... Uh, you know, how much actual weight that would be, but the fact is that the moon does this, um, uh, what do they call it, uh, where, it where it spins at the, at the top? Yeah, but what's it called? Libration. Another spaceship moon mystery is its libration. <clears throat> libration is the spaceship moon's wobble, and this wobble is theorized by mainstream science uh, to be caused by tidal lock. Tidal lock is a nonsensical theory to account for unknown forces like gravitons to account for gravity. Maybe the spaceship moon's libration or wobble is caused by the rotation of the moon uh, about the location of the gravity B wave generator, which is located further away from the Earth from the center of the spaceship's moon geocentric center. It's I curious to note that one cycle of libration is equal to one period of rotation of the spaceship moon. Are you saying Therefore, that 
this is one of the causes for the gravity on the far side of the moon, if you're on the surface, to be greater than it is on this side, and, that's, and so the atmosphere is on the other side of the moon? Or well, Peter Andreas Hansen felt that it was on the other side. But the fact is, if there was a more gravity further, uh, it would depend on the altitude whether the, air, whether the air was denser on the far side or the near side. What we don't know for sure is the, alti is the altitude, the mean altitude. Uh, if we knew that, we would be able to tell where the denser atmosphere is. But in any case, the denser atmosphere is going to go to the lower portion. This is a picture of the moon, and this was taken by um, um, Lick Observatory. And in any picture of the moon you see, any picture, from way back when up until now, there's a very bright spot up here which is called Aristarchus. You ask NASA or anything about it, they just say it's incredibly white, we don't know what's there or why it's like that. But in fact, last summer, we had an astronomer over in England take a picture. If this shows it, we found a what we assume is a fission reactor 29 miles in diameter. You can see the dome yeah. there. You can see the support sections there. And you see, can see the, uh, the gl blow glue, uh, the, the blue glow of uh, radiation while the reactor is going. Absolutely. So this is a nuclear reactor on the moon. It's visible on this side of the moon, right? Correct. And we've always been told it's just a, it's it's whited out on any photo you see. They just take a, a white out and they put it there. So but this in is fact, it's a incredible. beautiful. Now, did you talk to Hoagland about that? I can't remember whether I did, but I know he wouldn't admit it. This is the Clementine photo. You see how it's it's air, been airbrushed. All it is is. You know, just lines there. Um, we wondered whether you had any insights, intuitions, or anything else about what happened to Steve Fawcett. I flew for Baron Hilton for three years, both his uh, Hawker 125 and his Learjet, and many, many times went to the Flying M Ranch. And uh, <clears throat> so I'm very familiar with that, very familiar with Burn. And um, the fact is that the... Uh, um, Navy Undersea Warfare Center is only 16 miles to the east. Uh, it uh, just coincidence that it was only two days after I posted all this stuff on the internet about the sub, the uh, Naval Undersea Warfare Center, uh, and the battleship, uh, and Hawthorne's tie-in with the underground uh, submarine base, that Steve Fawcett disappeared. So what I theorize is that he took off and was just flying down there, saw an interesting place, flew around, and the Navy commander looked up and said, I'll bet you that's John Lear. Shoot that son of a bitch down. <laughs> so they shot him down and they went over there uh -huh. and they looked and found out it was Steve Fawcett and the Admiral said, we've made a mistake. I don't want anybody ever to know about this. Get rid of the airplane and the body. Crazy. That's very crazy. But, uh, you know, I, I say that semi tongue in cheek. There's no reason, that, you know, for Steve Fawcett to have disappeared like that. It's just unbelievable, considering the amount of money, the amount of airplanes, the amount of time that went into that search. How could he possibly disappear, you know? The problems I have with, you know, when he first disappeared, we heard that he was looking for, you know, a straightaway for his car. Well, um, you know, it's pretty obvious you can look on a map, you need seven miles, and there's not many dry lakes that are seven miles long, and even all dry lakes are on a map, so he wouldn't need to fly around to find some accidentally <laughs> undiscovered lake bed. I mean, that's ridiculous. Well, plus, he's not going to fly in the mountains for that, right? No. And then, you know, we heard that he took his watch, which had, which had the uh, automatic uh, emergency signal, and then it turned out, no, he didn't have his watch. Uh, but I will say this, the stories that he was shot down over restricted areas like Groom Lake or Tonopah Test Range is just ridiculous. That's well, not the way well, it happened. I happens. think he was recruited and sent to Mars or something. Pardon? The moon. I said, I think he was recruited, maybe forcibly, to work on, you know, on Mars or, or Moon. Very well could have been. There's some people that have disappeared I have some questions about. 
and the number one guy is Bob Nathan. Now, Bob Nathan was head of JPL's Viking Imaging, very well known, um, always accessible to the public. Bob Lazar and I went down to see him personally to ask him a question about Mars. We got badges, we were admitted personally, you know, he told us everything he knew. Uh, you know, it was easily accessible. Now you Google him on the, you, you Google him, and there's no record of the guy. Wow. It's like you go to Wikipedia and look for John Lear. He does not exist. And if you look into the records on Wikipedia, the, the only thing that said uh, no substantiation for anything he claimed. And that's it on Wikipedia. Now you can find Bob Lazar, Bill Lear, you know, uh, the man on the moon, Howard Menger, everybody else. But you can't find John Lear on Wikipedia. That's so Bob too. Nathan has disappeared as far as you know. As Google. Yeah, I can't find him. And the reason I looked for him was because I was telling the story of when Bob and I went down to JPL. And the reason we went down there is Bob just got out of S4. At S4, he was shown a picture of what they call um, Cydonia. And uh, there's pyramids there and a face on Mars. He was shown very clear pictures. And on the pyramids, there, there was no doubt. He could see doors, windows handles, door wow. handles, everything. I mean, it was a place where somebody lived. So our question was to Bob Nathan, were there any other pictures taken other than the two that Hoagland and DiPietro put in their book? And he said, no, not that we know of. And so then we said, well, you know, these pictures were taken uh, at a very low altitude. Was Viking ever taken lower than the pictures that Hoagland and Pietro have? Uh, and Nathan said, yes, but we didn't take any pictures from that lower altitude altitude. Yeah. Right. So what that tells us is how compartmentalization works again. Bob Nathan knew one part of his program, but right. not, Bob Nathan is not the head of the program, mm -hmm. you know. He just is the front man for the certain things that he does, you know. And it's the guys down in Australia, you know, Canberra, <laughs> that get the original signal that tell, you know, exactly right. uh, what's going on at a a girl named uh, Kathy Thomas that worked at Goldstone, and she used to tell us some funny stories, uh, Bob and me, because she would get the signals from Australia. And she'd say, we'd be sitting there waiting for, you know, Mars signals, and it would be 24 hours, and they'd say, uh, uh, they'd send a message down and say, well, are you guys done here brushing those pictures? We need them, you know? <laughs> and uh, so anyway, she invited me and Bob down to Goldstone, and we got the royal tour. I mean, we got up in the antenna and all the different places there. It was really great. Unfortunately, she got canned about two weeks after that, uh, and uh, she went to work for Raytheon up at the test site and haven't heard a word from her since. Uh, wow. Now, Bob says he's heard from her. Oh, but, yeah? But once you go to work there, I mean, you don't talk to anybody. Huh. For instance, if you go to work for Space Command in Colorado Springs, when you get hired, you're told to say goodbye to all your friends because you're going to have a whole new set of friends and they don't want you to accidentally, you know, meet an old friend and say, hey, you know, you'll never guess what I'm doing now, you know. They're serious. They say, say to all your say goodbye to your old buddies because you are not going to see them again. And that's how they avoid those little mix-ups like that. Wow, incredible stuff. Are you saying that, that uh, Bob Lazar was shown detailed pictures of Cydonia at S4 when he was yeah, working there? Yeah, he was shown the pictures of the- Do you know why he was shown those pictures? Part of his briefing. They told him, you know, the, the bases we had, the moon, the base we had on Mars. And, what does he remember about what he was told about the Mars base? You know, its function and, you know, how big it is and who else is there and... Nothing. I've told you everything he told me. So and all that was that he was shown the picture. We went down to ask Nathan about it and that's all he was told. Uh, when you decide what you're going to pursue, that's all they tell you about. In his pursuit, in his job, he wanted to do back engineer the propulsion. They don't brief you into anything else. Another interesting thing I, I want to talk to Dan Burrish about, you know, what sold me on Dan Burrish was the detail of the formalities. You know, when you get out of the airplane, what do they do? And Dan Burrish, I, I watched that videotape, you know, he spent an hour telling exactly what they do. I was so detailed, I don't see how anybody couldn't believe that stuff. Right. Uh, I mean, you just couldn't make that stuff up about being escorted here and, and the changing of the guard and all that stuff. But well, one of the things he said, he was weighed 
you know, they're weighed in and out and uh, very carefully, you know. And uh, what I want to tell them is the reason that, you know, that just came in a couple of years ago is because that started with Bob Lazar. Because on one of his trips up there, he took a little, that little 110 camera that was just about that big. And, he, and they didn't search him in those days. And he walked right into S4 with it. And he had a chair. And he leaned back like that. And he put it up into the leg. And then he was going to take a picture and bring it out. But we had his problem before he got it out. So after he left, somebody found that camera. <laughs> and that's when all the weighing started. <laughs> that's a great story. Um, OK, John, I have one last question. Okay. You flew for years and years and years, right, <coughs> as a major airline pilot. OK, so you were up there quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Did you ever see a UFO when you were flying? You know, as I explain to people, when you're flying, you're not looking for UFOs. You're looking at the instruments and seeing where you're going or, in my case, sleeping. So um, and then at night, um, you know, when it's easier to see UFOs, you're not looking outside. First of all, you've got a brightly lit instrument panel here, and it's reflecting on the window. Uh, and there's all kinds of reflections around. You're paying attention to what, what's going on, or like me, sleeping. And so it's very difficult. You wouldn't notice. You wouldn't have the chance to notice a UFO. Uh, you would have to put your face up to the window and cup your hands. You know, and who's going to do that, you know? Right. But yes, there's twice I saw UFOs. Once was uh, in 1966 <laughs> on descent into uh, um, Los Angeles in a Learjet over Palm Springs on that long descent through Panning Pass. And I was descending and I saw a white object going left to right across the front of me. And it looked exactly like an M2F2. And that's the flying bathtub that, you know, the $7 million man crashed in. You oh, remember that God. series? It, yeah. it, it, it didn't have any engines, or it had a little engine, but that was for landing, and it just looked like a flying bathtub. You mean the $6 million dollar man, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so when I landed, I even took the time to call the chief pilot of uh, Learjet, Hank Beer, and I said, hey, you're never going to believe what I saw. The M2F2 passed me today, you know, going into Palm Springs. Only years later did I realize how ridiculous ridiculous that was, that an M2F2 <laughs> would be flying across the main approach path to Los Angeles International Airport. You know, they only flew that thing way out in the desert. So, you know, obviously that was something. Okay, I mean, that, so twice. So that's and, one. And one. And then in Lockheed L-1011, uh, here just before I retired uh, with Kitty Hawk International going uh, westbound uh, over the Midwest. No, it was, more, it was just like south of Chicago. I was looking south, and of course the guys I flew with, you know, no one was interested in UFOs. They didn't want to know about it. They didn't want me to point out any UFOs. So I didn't even bother looking, you know, besides I'm usually asleep anyway. But it just happened that I was woken up here this time, and it was very, very dark and very quiet. And I saw this thing come like this and go, just way, way out in outer space. And I thought, wow, that was really something. And then I saw another one. And bam, out that, you know, I said, boy, that's really something, you know, I ought to tell these guys, but as soon as I do, there's not going to be another one, and I'm going to look like an idiot. So then here comes the <laughs> third one. Boom, like that. And I said, well, I'm going to try it. And I said, hey, guys, I want you to look at something over here. And they both came over there, and a fifth one came. And it went, boom, like that. And both of them sat down, boy. I never saw anything like that. So that was the second time. And it was really great because they both got to see That's it. That's amazing. There was no denying it. Wow. I mean, they were both That's in a fabulous. state of shock. And, you know, it was definitely a UFO, whether, we, you know, it was too small to see what it was. So what year was that? Do you remember? Would have been 98, 97, really? 98. Yeah. Not that long ago. So I'm sure that must have been our stuff. Okay, so people say, okay, John, uh, there's flying saucers and reptilians and secret bases and secret satellites and and uh, we did our own 9/11. We uh, we bombed ourselves and uh, there's wars and you say there's nuke wars and coming. You know what are we supposed to do all of, with all this? I mean, what's the point of all this? <clears throat> the point of all this is to try and advance in your in your life. And the way that you can do that is to try and live your life without envy, hate, or greed. Also, to spend as much time 
with your family and tell them how much you love them. That's really all we can do. We can't be responsible for the, the bad guys. We can't be responsible for the children that are having so much trouble in the world. We can't be responsible for the nuclear wars that are going on. All we can do is be responsible for ourselves. And that's to live our lives without envy, hate, or greed, and to tell each member of our family how much we love them and to tell them that every day. I try without living without envy, hate, and greed, but there sure are a lot of assholes out there, so. <laughs> <laughs> but, That's uh, great, but the I part, think we'll make that our ending. But um, the, <laughs> <laughs>
but both Adamski and Menger, I think they both either saw it or went there. Well, well there's also supposed to be some uh, who White House. This is Valiant Thor. Um, this is the stranger at the Pentagon. Oh, Val story. Thor. Val Thor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Val Thor. That was that was told um, by Frank Strangis. Mm -hmm. who wrote this book called Stranger at the Pentagon. And if I remember right, I haven't read the book, if I remember right, Val Thor was supposedly from Venus, and that was before they decided to cancel the Venus story. Right. Um, what do you know about that? Only that his, Val's ship was supposed to be parked right out here at uh, Lake Mead, and I have the coordinates where you can go right up there and see where it was. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's all I, I know about that. Val Thor, but... One of the people who we met after, after we interviewed you was Bob Dean, who you must know quite well. Mm. Wonderful man. Um, he told us that the, that the aliens who the authorities were most worried by were the ones who were indistinguishable from ourselves. Right. And who were walking the corridors of the Pentagon and in government and in the military and, you know, walking down the street and you'd never know the difference. Have you heard anything Have you about heard that? that? There are aliens like that, but the problem is <clears throat> we allied ourselves with the wrong aliens. We think that the Greys are our enemy, and that's why we built those 12, or at least 12, weapons-based platforms for the direct energy weapons that circle the globe now. And we started in 1968, before Apollo ever went, and we've been building it ever since. Huh. And what they what they intend to do, and, and when I say they, I'm talking about the nasty NASA, NASA Nazis, <clears throat> is if they can't get rid of the Greys, they're going to blow up Earth because they don't want the Greys to have what they consider the prize. They don't understand that there's billions of Earths. There's billions of Earths just identical to us, all in various stages of development, you know. and. Uh, they think they're going to destroy Earth, and they're not. Now, in support of that story, one of the first things Bob told me that night was he saw a message that we sent to the owners of the Greys, and it was, either you help us get rid of the Greys or nobody's going to have Earth. And that's when Bob told me about the super weapon that we have that could destroy a continent half the size of South America. <clears throat> and since then, I've heard, you know, really... Uh, knowledgeable guys say, yeah, we, we have some really frightening weapons and I'm not sure how it's going to turn out. So the plan is the guys who, who run all of this stuff are going to destroy The plan is to destroy us if they can't get rid of the Greys. And of course, they're not going to get rid of the Greys. The Greys are all over the friggin' place. Right. They're, I can't say they're beneficial. They have a job to do and that's to take care of the containers. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's evil. But that's their job, and there's nobody going to interfere with that. So they will almost certainly protect us from any kind of disaster that's going to come along. But meanwhile, the nasty... Okay, nasty, well, what about the reptilians? They're a separate deal, I'm sure. Um, they have their own civilization. They're probably underground. Um, <clears throat> well... I mean, you certainly know that there's more than one kind of gray, right? Yeah, there's, there's plenty of them. And there's plenty of different types of reptilians. And Ron Schmidt and I are talking with a guy, um, really a knowledgeable scientist, you know, a guy that, you know, would sit down and be comfortable about talking with anything. And he told us our, our his first encounter with a reptilian. And it was so believable. You know, he's working across the lab, and he just looks over at this guy and asks him a question. And he says... The second eyelid went down for a second, you know. <laughs> uh, contacted by somebody who's a scientist, who actually is a nephew of uh, one of the ex-CIA directors. He's a solid, very smart guy. Mm -hmm. And he went in just for a couple of days at one point to do a particular technical job in Dulcie. This is how this is how this little conversation started. And as part of his briefing for going to Dulcie, he was told about what he should do if he should encounter a reptilian. Mm -hmm. This was part of the briefing, very matter of fact. And uh, what he was told 
is that if you encounter one of these guys, you drop your hands with your palms open to show that it's, it's, it's a gesture of supplication and shows that you're not a threat. So you don't do that, you do that. And he said that that's what you do with these guys, and then they'll leave you alone. And he did encounter one of these. He, he encountered one reptilian in silent communication with one grey. And just on one occasion, just for a few moments. And he did what he was told, you know, and he said that this large creature was uh, awesome and arrogant and cold and looked like it could just, you know, kill you with a single blow. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you just back away, back away slow, and everything was cool, and everything was cool. And he told us this in a very matter of fact way. Absolutely. And, uh, I believe it 100%. It sounds like. Now, does that match with what you know? Many stories I've heard.